my name is indeed Justin Ribeiro, and uh, I'm a developer and Firebase, and when you fill out your GPG surveys, you can say, hey, I learned about Firebase today a little bit. So uh, what exactly do we mean when we talk about real time? So we have this sort of traffic of things in real time. We'll just use the button. We're not going to use any button now. Thank you, slides. Good slides. Up, go, go, yay. So when we talk about real time, I often talk about it in, in the sort of theory of the internet of things. Uh, because these things that are out in the world stream massive amounts of data to us that we want to do something with as developers. Uh, they tell us about our homes, they tell us about our businesses. If you've worked in sort of the industrial landscape of things, uh, you may have used them to talk to machines on a PLC or some other sort of line mechanic. Uh, all these data streams exist, but we don't really necessarily have all this wonderful place to use them, right? There are competing protocols and technologies and all kinds of stuff that we have to deal with. And so what today I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about some tools that we can use to sort of bridge these gaps for the old Internet of Things stuff. So take a moment to think about what you consider the Internet of Things to be. Now, as developers or engineers, we may think of Internets of Things like this. A breadboard with tons of wires spewing forth, with some receiver or some output. Uh, we might be looking at this horrible mess of uh, jumpers and bridging and say to ourselves, you know what, it looks good to me, it works. I can see my standard out on my console against this device. But the reality is, is that that's not the way our users see the world, right? Our users don't see this bench full of things. They don't want to see this bench full of things. They want a seamless experience that sort of bridges all the context for them. They simply want to use a wonderful application to deal with our problems. So they're looking for polish. They're looking for that thing that sort of resolves their problem. So a lot of times I think about this in terms of things like nests protocol. Anyone ever used nests, uh, thermostats or devices before? It's such a lovely experience. It's very clean. It understands things. You don't care about how it moves data around. It's a very seamless shift. Our expectations for, as a user change. We're able to seamlessly interact with these things in our world. Um, but it's hard, right? As developers, you're like, well, you know, I don't have, like, what a protocol do I use? And how do I deal with this sort of problem? And how do I go from that huge mess of wires to this thing on the web or on my Android device? Uh, and today we're going to primarily talk about the web. And for that, it's never been easier to deliver a great experience. Uh, and to do that, we're going to talk about Firebase and Polymer. So, this is two parts to a puzzle. There's a lot of pieces to the wonderful Internet of Things puzzle landscape that exists today. Uh, and we're going to kind of cover some of these things. So, first, what is Firebase exactly? Um, Firebase is our back end. It becomes an effortless, effortless way to sync and store data without having to actually deal with syncing or storing data. We don't have to worry about the schema structures. We don't have to worry about sort of how we deal with the things that we might deal with in terms of APIs or web services or databases. It's all seamless for us. It syncs instantly across a wide range of device platforms and we don't have to do the heavy lifting. We can do all the things we want to do without having to worry about the streaming logistics. Uh, we get instant scalability. Like, we don't have to worry about, well, do I need to set up a load balancer? And does this load balancer, uh, how does it deal with session stickiness? And, well, wait, does, uh, do I need SSL? And, wait, how do I get SSL? Like, these are all problems that we face as developers, right? There's this huge chain that we have to deal with. And Firebase resolved that for us. We don't have to worry about that scalability. We don't have to worry about those keys. Um, and with this, you, you do have to understand, like, it's all API. We don't have to worry about the tables. We can simply put JSON in, get JSON out, and it's all good. We don't have to worry about SQL. How many, day, how many times has your day been ruined by SQL? I can count them 
I don't have enough hands to count them on how many days that SQL has ruined for me. Um, and with Firebase, we don't have to worry about that. Uh, but Firebase is our backend. We need some way to represent that data for us. And for that, we have Polymer. So Polymer uh, is not a framework. Uh, there is this misconception that Justin, Polymer is a framework. I can't use it with X. Uh, X could be React or insert your favorites uh, framework here. Um, Polymer is a library. It gives us uh, a worldview back to our roots as web developers, where everything can be an element. The things that we want, a composable infrastructure, allows us to define our sort of elements the way we want to define them and have them interact with the DOM APIs that we want to use. Um, and they're all built on top of this wonderful new standard set of web APIs we call as a conjunction little group, web components. So you have things like the custom elements API, you have things like templates, uh, you have things like shadow DOM. Like these items together allow us to build really reusable things that we can use in our web applications that work across a wide range of devices. So uh, they're composable, they're reusable, they're interoperable. The interoperable part being key because every, every once in a while someone pings me and says, Justin, it doesn't work, work with X. Um, it doesn't work with the new hotness that I saw in Hacker News yesterday. What is wrong? And what is wrong is, is that there is no thing wrong. You have to understand that how you interact with them is through the DOM API and the APIs that you can actually define within these all little awesome elements that we decide. So we can define the HTML that doesn't exist. How many times have you ever wanted a tag that you're saying, well, I, I just, I wish it existed. I wish I didn't have to write 27 div, ta div tabs into a span of soup just to make a tab show up, right? That was my last week. It was horrific. But web components in Polymer help us resolve that sort of thing across a wide range of mobile and desktop platforms. Uh, so what are we kind of talk about specifically today? So uh, we're going to talk about a few things. The first thing we're going to talk about uh, is this mess of things, which I could have swore was an animated GIF, but apparently it's not. So uh, we're going to explain how to take Firebase data from a particular Internet of Thing. Uh, I'm sorry, we're going to take data from a particular Internet of Thing, bridge that data out, and send it off onto our Firebase instance, and then it's going to magically update seamlessly our mystical graph here. Um, written in Polymer. So, this is the basic chain. Device, the bridge, Firebase, Polymer, happy users. Okay? Um, there are lots of ways to do bridges. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about bridges to sort of help us understand why this part exists uh, between device and Firebase. So, Internet of Things. Um, Chances are, if I pulled the audience, eventually we'd come across the notion that, wow, there are a lot of protocols one can use to talk to all these mystical devices. You have things like PLE, you have things like MQTT, you have Zigbee, you have Z-Wave, you have CoAP, you've got 27 gazillion things. You're saying to yourself, I just want to get it to one place that I can work with it and have a nice day. Um, in a perfect world, you know, maybe we're all running, you know, our Pi-esque fantasy land, where we can use things like Node and just say, hey, N NPM this for me, install these things. Um, but the reality is really different. Uh, we have a cauldron of devices from a variety of manufacturers, all with a very large amount of APIs. And to help us resolve this, we're going to bridge. And a bridge is nothing more than, I want to get the data out of this thing and send it to something that I can actually use. So. Firebase has clients. You have the JavaScript client, the Android client, the iOS client. Um, and they also have a Python client, which is not from them, but is readily available and basically wraps the REST API. So Firebase can be interacted with through the REST API, and you can use it in a variety of ways. And in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to bridge with Python, uh, a little Python daemon, that's going to send out SNMP traffic from a particular device, in this case, it was just something that we had randomly at work that was spewing forth SNP data, uh, and we're going to use that and send it off to Firebase. So here we can see that we've kind of got this Firebase connection. Uh, we're loading an SNP profile. Anyone ever at work with SNMP? Anybody? I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. It's so much stuff, and just like I just want to go back to like not having to parse this horrible thing. 
So we can load profiles to help, so, help resolve some of that. And in this case, uh, we're using uh, one of the Python libs. We're pulling out this raw data from our adapter. And then we're just going to say, hey, post me to a particular child and or endpoint on Firebase. And the data magically shows up where we want it to go. Now, this is a fairly simplified example. All this source code is available on GitHub if you want to look at it later. Uh, as to the, like, the rest of it. Um, but this is one example. Now, SNMP is its own sort of beast. You could also bridge out from MQTT or COAP or anything else that you want to particularly pull data from, or some proprietary API. Because we know that some manufacturers like to use proprietary APIs with their own crazy protocols that just make our lives slightly miserable. Um, but at the end of the day, if we can get it to Firebase, we can probably wire it to whatever we want. So, um, and in practice, it looks kind of like this. Um, this is a slightly slower example, uh, but it guides the data where we want it to go. Uh, you do have to be wary of how much data you are sending, uh, because if you sit there and pummel it, you may find that your experience is less than so far. But at the end of the day, you can punch as much data uh, as you want. Uh, and they have scalability as well, in terms of how Firebase scales. So we get that scalability, we don't have to worry about it, we can simply upgrade our plan. plan. We want more horsepower behind it, either through concurrent connections or just the thing that runs and stores all that data for us. And at this point, we're pushing data using nothing more than a post call in Python, and we've written no SQL code. I didn't have to write an insert statement. I didn't have to figure out what the, heck, what the schema was. I just wrote it as an object or a dictionary, and then magically it goes in there. So now that the data is actually there, we can decide what we actually want to do with it. So at this point, we get into the wonderful world of Polymer. Now, this screenshot, you're saying, wow, Justin, Polymer looks really nasty. That's not Polymer. But uh, you can see that this might look familiar to you uh, if you've ever looked at the source code of a web page of DevTools or some other thing. Can anyone gander? I realize it's probably really hard to read because it was hard enough just to take a screenshot to actually squeeze this code into a frame. Anyone have a gander or a guess at what this might actually be, application-wise? Anybody? Google. It's a Google thing. It's actually Gmail. So you see this wonderful land of div soup. Uh, and it's jumble, and it's messy, and it's got style injected there, and it's got iframes. And you're like, wow, that is tough. Like, it's probably happened to you over the course of things, right? Um, where something simple becomes something very complex on the web. Uh, and the common example that you'll often hear is tabs. Um, you look at Bootstrap's tabs, you look at jQuery UI's tabs, you have a, a series of markup that ends up looking very div soup esque with weird identifiers and everything. It's very messy, it's not semantic. Like, how do you know that it's this thing? Like, I don't know what KJJDK7 means. Like, is that a message? Who knows? I don't know. Could be. Um, and we lose our ability to sort of grok what's going on. Uh, and so there are ways around this, right? So as web developers, we know that, well, hey, Justin, I could use an iframe, and I can just bundle it in this thing. Or I can, you know, I can sectionalize it off so I don't have style clashes. Um, but it's hard, right? There are little tiny hacks that try to compartmentalize your code, but they don't kind of work, right? Uh, because at the end of the day, they have significant drawbacks, uh, particularly in the inner ways we want to interact with our web application. So to help us resolve this, we have things like web components, and particularly, we have Polymer. So Polymer can help us solve our problem in our div soup by allowing us to create reusable, interoperable components that we can drop in. Um, and the beauty of this is, is that we can data bind them out. So Polymer has two-way data binding, or single-way data binding, depending on how you define things. And you get all this power at your fingertips. It's a whole bunch of syntactic sugar on top of web standards. So the web standards are your basic line core, and then Polymer says, here's our world view of the world. We want to add data binding. We want to add mutation observation. We want to do these things to make your developer life slightly easier. So, let's talk about reusable components and sort of what they look like. So here we have a dashboard. Uh, this goes also on GitHub. 
uh, and you can review it all, but this is a generic example of our what we're going to create today. Uh, so we're going to create a bandwidth gauge. We're going to take all that SMP data that we just bridged out in Firebase, and we're going to take it and put it into our nice little tag that we have decided to name bandwidth task gauge. Now, you're saying, Justin, well, wait, there's no bandwidth task gauge. Uh, how are you just magically writing this mystical thing? The beauty of web components, they allow us to do these things. We can define the elements that don't exist in our world to use in our applications. So there are a couple things on this slide that we're going to take a look at. So initially, you'll see this import. And it looks like your typical sort of import. But you've got this bandwidth.sgh.html. And that's going to be the core of our component. It's going to have all the guts and all the things that we want bandwidth gauge to do. Uh, and it's going to define that in a way that we can simply import into our DOM and use. Like, we don't have to do anything else. And then from there, we're going to look and say, okay, well, that import's done. Hey, good news. I can use this tag, and I can use this element to do whatever I decide I want. And you'll note as you look at it uh, that it's got an ID. Like, well, Justin, like, you can't just randomly use ID. Like, that's a DOM thing. You can, because web components extend off from the DOM. So not only do you get the power of building your own API, you also get the power that the DOM provides you. You get to use the same things. I can query select that and say, hey, I want to do something with bandwidth gauge. Uh, so you get this sort of power, but you also get the power of your own attributes. So now I have a thing called scale. And I have a thing that I says, OK, well, I'm going to scale this based on some mystical number that I have provided. And that's probably the least semantic thing I've got there. Like, that doesn't really make much sense. Like, what's scale, man? But I can name it whatever I want. I have that power to define that thing. So uh, then we get into the then we get into the guts. We get into the bandwidth dash gauge portion of it. Because you're saying, Justin, I don't believe you that this component thing is going to work. Uh, I think you have come up with some witchcraft to fool us on this mystical day of code. Uh, so you end up with this scenario of, well, okay, well now I'm importing something else. So I want Polymer as my base. I'm going to use Polymer to handle sort of my definition of this element. Now, there are different ways to sort of do this in Polymer. I'm going to do it the, uh, the most descriptive way. You can do this in JavaScript as well, technically, if you're more on the JavaScript and client side. Um, but this is pretty much the standard format of things uh, in current Polymer, where you have this thing called dome-module. It has an ID uh, that defines a particular name. Uh, you have a template which has style and it has lo uh, it has local uh, local dome within it, which is this highlighted part. And you're saying, well, it just looks like divs and stuff. It is local dome is yours to play with. You can name it whatever you want. I can have those IDs named all day long, and they can conflict with things at the top level. But because they're in the shadow dom, uh, and if you don't have support for the shadow dom, the shady dom, which is Polymer's polyfill shim, um, you can deal with this. Like, they can be your thing. You can define them. And all of a sudden, that problem we had before with crazy naming of attributes to make sure we don't have name conflict and not create some mystical style that applies and is bolding red on every page, uh, which literally happened to something we were working on the other day because someone didn't understand that cascading means cascading in the style sheet. Um, it does mean cascading, right? I'm just not just, just checking. Uh, so that's, you can define that sort of template stuff for you. Um, and our style is shadow dome scope. So the kicker with this is that these styles are inherent within the scope. They're not going to bleed and, and bubble up to the top. All right. So I can define styles and I can say, well, ID name is going to be red. Um, you'd be skippy for us. Doesn't go and say everything that's I, you know everything above and a div is going to be red. Um, we can scope that down, and it uses the standard sort of shadow dome filing for styles. So you also know that we've got some random things in here. So if you use handlebars or mustache or insert your templating library here and just talk, um, you'll note that you have like name and bandwidth that's speed and bandwidth that unit that can sort of define the things that we want to actually bind data to, um, which gets us into sort of the property methodology of things. So besides this sort of local DOM scope world of things, we also need some script. Um, so this is also inherent with our bandwidth gauge. And you've got Polymer defining these bandwidth gauge, which is very important. And basically, uh, it's basically our create element call that's going to create this element for us. Uh, we have properties. And you can say, well, um, Justin, normally properties are only like strings and such. 
But then you have this cool thing down here, band with which is an object. Like, I can have a, I can have an object as a property. Like, this is awesome. And you can define your properties that are inherent to your API. They can be the things that you want to particularly use. Um, and these sorts of things are what really start to get to the like crispy goodness parts of the column, where you're saying, well, wait, I can define this, and that means I can, I can pass data into it and just magically hook things. Like, is that how Firebase works in this scenario? It kind of does, and it's awesome, and I love it. So. The cool thing is, is that not only can you say, well, I'm passing things in, you can observe those changes. You can say, well, if I have some external source of data that's pushing into my element, I can sit there and say, well, I can observe that change and fire something on, on that change. So in this case, we define an observer. There's a few different ways to do this in Polymer. It's in the documentation. I, particular, I chose this particular way today. Uh, but says, hey, if bandwidth changes, fire update chart. And in this case, update chart is going to call and say, do all the logic I want to make a magical spinning gauge. Um, do the math. Fiddle with it. It's all good. So the beauty of it is, is that again, we're scoped. We're in our little tiny sandbox of love. And says, haha, I'm just my component. I can take it. I can write my code. I can observe changes that things are passed into it. And I don't have to worry necessarily about the outside world. I can only worry about the things that I control, the API that I have defined. So let's wire up dashboard gauge or bandwidth gauge. Let's just say I'm going to put some data in this bad boy, and uh, we're going to see what happens. So you're saying, Justin, well, that requires the mystical lands of JavaScript. And, uh, but I don't know how it works with your mystical web component tags. I think it's going to be a nightmare. I'm here to show you that it indeed is not. So you'll note that in this case, we're looking for web component web components ready as an event to make sure that our components are within our DOM, they're ready to go, it's all good. And then we have this mystical, magical thing called document.getElementById, which is really, really custom. Like, I had to really define this and this thing uh, to really make it work within all the browsers and such uh, to work with our web components, which many of you have a raised eyebrow right now because you obviously know that is not true. GetElementById has been in the DOM for a long time, and you're saying, well, wait, you can just literally call GetElementById against the ID name? and your magical custom element will actually, like, you can do that? Indeed you can, because we have DOM methods on there. We can pull it and say, well, great, I now have this thing, right? And I can say, well, hey, you know what? You also have bandwidth as a property uh, within your uh, object. So good news, I can define bandwidth through it and just pass it the object that I want to do. Using nothing more than normal DOM methods. Oh, it's magic. Oh, it's lovely. Oh. So uh, it's not as custom as web components sound, because obviously one of the APIs is called custom elements. Um, you still get that power, the power that you know as a web developer for the things that you might normally do in your applications and your environments. So you don't have to sit there and relearn an entire new scope of things. I can sit there and say, well, wait, um, I, I found a nifty little date picker component. Uh, it's a web component. So I'm going to drop it into place, and then it has this little API, and I can call it, put it anywhere I want. It's scoped to its thing. I can pass colors or some other variables into it, uh, which Polymer supports as theming options. Um, and then I can use my methods just to call, and it just does the magic of things. So it's, it's quite powerful when you get down to it. But you're saying, well, pff, Justin, I don't see any Firebase on this slide. Anybody can call get element by ID. You are indeed correct. Uh, so realistically, we want to wire it up to some Firebase. So initially, I thought to myself, well, you know what? Let's start with some Firebase that everybody might have seen and or known from random sorts of things over time. So in this case, we're just using the standard JS lib uh, that you would include on any page to use Firebase via JavaScript in your application. Uh, and you can see, again, we're web components ready. Uh, our, our components are fired up and available in the DOM, uh, and we just created a Firebase run. Uh, in this case, uh, we're pointing to some mystical endpoints. We've got a child, and then we're saying, well, you know what? Every time something gets added to this child, give me the last one, uh, and I'm going to take that raw data, and then I'm going to do the same thing I just did, which was, oh, hey, no problem. 
document that you can get down to by ID out.bringwidth equals whatever my particular value object is from that snapshot. So you can use Firebase to instantly wire it in JavaScript the normal way you would do it with your components all in the magic of your own home. Uh, it doesn't require much more than that. You can actually interact with uh, the library uh, and the DOM just like this. No big deal. Um, there's an example on the Polymer Summit site at the moment in terms of the code labs that sort of goes into this as well. I'll point it out at the end if you're like, really want an example of the test yourself. That's something you can build. Um, but yeah, you can use this straight away. But then you're saying, I know what you're saying. I, I know what you're thinking. I've been in your shoes sitting in the magical white chairs. Uh, you're saying, well, Justin, I thought you said that Polymer has an element for everything. Isn't that the whole web components thing? There's an element for everything. Well, indeed, there is an element for everything. Let's talk about elements for everything. So we have Firebase elements. Um, if you look at elements, uh, the elements catalog for Polymer, uh, you'll find that there is indeed a, quite a few Firebase elements. Uh, particularly, we're going to talk about Firebase Dash Collection. And I'll kind of explain a couple of the other ones, though it gets more into in-depth things. So um, let's pretend for a second that you use, use, have used jQuery. Anybody ever used jQuery? I know it's a new library that no one's ever heard of. You know, real new, like just came out last week. Oh wait, it's been around forever. I don't, you know, like 90% of the internet probably uses jQuery at this point. Actually, I think it's more like 75%. Like it's used jQuery uh, in terms of like master, master things. So jQuery plugins, if anybody's ever used them, you probably say to yourself, well, I just download a jQuery plugin, I put it in my page, and then I don't have to worry about it. Like, like this, like how do I deal with like this Firebase thing? Like, do I have to like magically use stuff? And like, how does it work? Well, it is similar. You can use things like Bower to install components with uh, as a dependency. You can also say, well, I just want to download Firebase Dash Collection and include it in my import as a thing. Uh, that works too. So it is that very much like that web developer flow that we probably all started out with if we've ever done anything. Right? I found a library I liked, I found a plugin, I take it, I import it via script uh, or other import methods uh, or loaders, and then you use that thing within your page. So things like Firebase Dash Collection or particularly any particular element, you don't have to have a massive amount of tooling if you don't want. You can use, you just go and pull the download. As a matter of fact, the elements catalog for Polymer actually gives you a download option, which will download a nice little zip, which you can simply unzip and add to your project. Uh, and then you can import them as needed. So we can import it like anything else. Like we don't have to necessarily change our world of view of how we do this sort of thing. Um, but you're also saying, well, Justin, that, that looks like a tab. Like, isn't that going to like do things? Like, is it going to display? Like, what does it do? And you can think of it as the mystical data connector of things. So Firebase collection, you're looking at it and going, well, it kind of looks like that JavaScript you just wrote. Um, a little bit more succinctly or declaratively, right? We declared a tag in our code. We typed it like normal HTML. That tag surely does not exist in the spec, but there it is. I can, and then it's only the last one, I can still point to my endpoints, and I can pull data out of it. And you're saying, well, wait, well, how does the data get to the thing, and is there a freeway on-ramp I take somewhere there? Um, so what happens is, is that in this case, we're going to use another little cool Polymer feature. We're going to use template is dom repeat. So, sounds kind of self-explanatory. You can think of it as a loop. It's going to take our data as, I, as items, or we're going to inject as items, and then we're going to say as a device thing comes out. Uh, and we're going to say, hey, bandwidth gauge and bandwidth gauge, good news. Hey, pump in some data every time something happens. And every time, we normally nominate two-way data binder. Uh, and we update things. Now, you're also probably saying to yourself, well, wait, Justin, doesn't that also update the DOM every time you do the thing? Indeed it does. Uh, this is a, not necessarily the fastest example of it, but I wanted to show a declarative example to show you the other way to do things as a means to do it. And I'll show you another example here in a second that'll sort of further explore this sort of topic, the declarative nature of things. Apparently I had highlights. So let us pretend that uh, this link still works, of which I'm almost positive it doesn't. 
<laughs> because I think that device died at the office, to be quite honest with you, so it's probably a very static thing at the moment. Um, but all said and done, when we finally built this component and we've got data from Firebase pumping into it, it looks sort of like this, where it's actually tracking the amount of traffic that's going through that thing, being bridged out from SNMP to Firebase, listening via wonderful Firebase polymer together into this component. I could duplicate this component 10 times over and the DOM would not care. Presuming, of course, that my animation code is up to snuff and I don't jank the living daylights out of it. Uh, which is his own talk. Please come to my other talk. Justin talks about jank. That, I'm not doing another talk today. I'm just joking. Uh, we're not talking about jank today. Uh, but we could take that component and reuse it for anything we want. And you could say, well, what if I want to use it? You can. Download it, stick it in your code, pass it a whole bunch of data that matches the API signature, and magically you will have mystical half circles that spin and spin and spin. So, this is one thing. You're like, well, Justin, like, that's, you know, that's great and whatnot. It's like, do you have other examples of things? Of course I have other examples of things. Plywood connected. Yeah. Sorry, Iron Robot with a blade. I'm sure that's not dangerous. Uh, so, Plywood Connected is uh, something that we came up with at the office a little while ago. It's open source, all the code is available. Um, and uh, what it basically is, is literally a, a series of projects that take plywood and connect them to the internet via bridges and a whole bunch of other random stuff. Um, it's an ongoing sort of thing. We initially wrote it um, as MQTT to Firebase Bridges with a web front end. Uh, we're working on an Android front end right now, uh, which is going to be all kinds of fun. And the gist of it is, is that you end up with devices, Cornhole, anyone ever play Cornhole? A classic mystical game of fun. Um, ours are a little souped up, uh, so here's a picture of us playing in the parking lot at the office. Um, so we've got a few projectors sitting on some gutted servers, because that's how we do things uh, in the parking lots. Uh, with some screens that actually have Palmer apps that are running uh, connected to Firebase. Uh, and the rings in there are basically uh, NeoPixels. So if you ever look, work with Adafruit's NeoPixels, they're NeoPixels that we've wired into a circle. They're not quite regulation, I get it. They're not six inches, they're six and, or they're five and a half inch wide. Yeah, you gotta be a little bit more accurate, it's all right. Um, and these are actually wired out with uh, Arduino units. So. Uh, they bridge out to an MQTT broker. The broker says, hey, subscribers, I'm right here. Uh, the bridger says, good news, I, I want to send you to Firebase so I can store the state of things of the score. And then whatever's listening to that thing, be it Polymer or Android, can update the magical store list. So they're all just random stuff we've sort of come up with. Uh, and we can sort of look at some code that goes around that thing, sort of show how it kind of operates. Now, there's actually quite a bit of code for this, and I don't have time to go through it all. Uh, so I'm going to give you a sort of high-level overview of it. Um, but all the code is on GitHub under the Plywood Connected organization on GitHub. Uh, you can take it, you can fork it, you can build your own cornhole boxes, and eventually our, our, our Internet Connected Cutting Green, um, which we just demoed uh, with the other day, and it's ridiculous, because who doesn't want an Internet Connected Cutting Green in your office? Um, so, again, we notice that, uh, in this case, we're defining an element. So we're defining cornhole-game. Um, cornhole-game basically is the scope of that game. So we took the approach and saying, well, we're never going to just have one set of cornhole boxes. We're going to have matches of cornhole boxes and hundreds of them out in the world connecting to this magical thing. So you can define games as basically two teams. Cornhole team is another tag that we, or element rather, that we've created. Red team and blue team in this case. Um, we're again using Firebase collection against the location target in games. We're listening for these new things on child on Firebase dash child added uh, and child changed. Um, and we from there those methods are basically internal to this component. So we're listening for those two things and updating our DOM as required here. So initially we're taking the games out and saying, well, how many teams do we have? Uh, in this case, uh, we're kind of using the same approach that I did with the mystical spinner. Uh, we're saying, well, just feed me data into this thing, because we know that it's not a very fast updating game. It's actually a very slow updating game, as Internet of Things goes. Um, unless you're really good at cornhole, in which case, kudos to you, come play us up in Oakdale, which is 
that way, thereabouts. Um, no problem, Josh. Just keep taking pictures. I'm, I'm looking fantastic right now. Um, so, just point. Just point. <laughs> that, was that a good one? Oh, I'm sorry. You want one more point? There you go. There we go. So, <laughs> so, again, very deductive approach, right? We can see it. Like, we didn't imperatively have to define these things. And if we look at the JavaScript that's sort of behind it, I sliced off most of the game logic here. You can see that I, I just wrote just some top of logic for the slide because I couldn't possibly fit it all in here as we started to do the checks. Um, but you can see that we basically have this observer that's observing the collection when it changes. So this is slightly different, um, primarily because um, the first slide was a slide I wrote for I.O. I gave a variation of this talk at Google I.O. this year. So um, you'll notice that we're listening for this change event from the data that's actually being pumped out. From there, we can actually take that snapshot value and just say, hey, update when something actually happens. So cool feature, cool utility feature polymer right here. The double dollar sign. It's going to go look at your local DOM, pull the first element of the parts. So um, utility functions in polymer that you use within an element really helps speed up the development of things um, that sort of create uh, an easier sort of development environment for us as developers. So you can see that we would run this and make sure that the game is not locked. Basically, a locked game for us means that the game was over. Um, and someone was just trying to, you know, trying to cheat because you, you, you know, you you have those people in the office. I know we all do. Uh, and then at that point, scores updated and things like that. Again, all the codes on GitHub. I apologize. I had to slice the slide a lot. Um, but Justin, I'm really not buying into the cornhole thing, uh, and you don't have the golf course thing on here. Are there other things that happen in the polymer wor or the Firebase world, or polymer world, or worlds of internet things, doing similar things? Of course there are. So. Um, uh, Firebase button, all the things. So this is actually a screenshot again. Should have been a GIF. Don't know why the GIF's not working today. That's pretty much my Saturday sometimes. So uh, this is Firebase button, all the things. Uh, this is actually from an older article that uh, Jenny had wrote, who works on the cloud team uh, for Firebase at the moment, or at the time she worked on Firebase. Now she's on cloud. Um, Jenny has a whole bunch of Firebase Internet of Things sort of examples, from robots that fight each other, uh, basically in her slides to uh, little internet connected toys that you can sort of do. Uh, and they use things like Pies and Arduinos that are listening for events that pump out. Because the problem with an Arduino, right, is that one, if you add Wi-Fi to it, you're gold. But two, uh, processing power doesn't really do SSL very well, so uh, TLS can be trouble, troublesome. So in that case, if Pi is real nice, you can simply bridge out and send stuff. Uh, she's got more examples online. You can always check that out. Uh, I'm actually doing pretty good on time. I'm feeling pretty good about this self. And for that, we're just going to dance a little bit. My Rick and Morty dance time. Ah. Anybody watch Rick and Morty? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Rick and Morty things. Woo. Season three will be so long away. Um, so, yay, Polymer and Firebase. Uh, things you can do to learn more about these things. Uh, so. Polymer Summit was this year. There's a whole bunch of videos. Rob Dobson's got a really great video on Polymer and Firebase uh, that goes really in depth into how to build an application end to end for a to do, to -do app. Um, the code lab for that very thing that he builds, uh, there's a variation at the Polymer Summit uh, code lab site where you can do all kinds of uh, basically code labs that are specific to Polymer. So there's a service worker code lab. Anybody use service worker yet? Anybody? Anybody? You service worker, make your apps available offline. It's the proxy of the internet, and it's landing soon in Firefox too. Uh, so the uh, collabs are going to follow. The Firebase one is there as well. I definitely recommend it if you're getting started with Firebase and Polymer, or just want to learn a little bit about both at the same time. Uh, they're pretty cool. Uh, there are a couple other things that it uses, primarily it's Firebase-Document, uh, which gets noted but not in use. If you want a Firebase-Document example, basically how two-way data binding updates things. Uh, I have an example on GitHub for that as well, uh, how to do that in Polymer. Um, it's a little bit, uh, it can be a little finicky at the moment. There's a bug, I think, uh, that hasn't quite gotten fixed. But definitely do the code labs. If we're looking for code labs of things, let me know how they go. If you have questions, you can always ping me. Uh, documentation of things, polymerproject.org, firebase.com. Firebase element documentation is on, on the elements repo. 
uh, now, uh, or in the Elements collection, rather, sorry. Uh, my bandwidth sample code is on GitHub as well. The cornhole and golf course sample code is also on GitHub. Uh, I will make the slides available to send out to everybody. YouTube.com slash Google Developers. Also, YouTube.com slash Chrome Developers for all your Chrome developer needs. Do watch uh, Awesome Polymer videos by Rob. They are top notch uh, for all your Polymer needs. And then that magically is time. 41 minutes, 40 seconds. A new record. Usually I go along. Thank you. I will be around the rest of the day, so if you have questions, please come ask me. If there are questions, I've got about four minutes, according to my watch, uh, that I can attempt to answer and hopefully not screw up horribly. <laughs> So if you want to use Polymer with, uh, on the platforms, what you would do is wrap with Cordova, so, uh, or PhoneGap, depending on which one you want to use. Um, does it work? Yes. Um, depending on your device platform stuff, uh, you may need crosswalk as sort of the stopgap, depending on how far back you want to go on certain devices. So, so crosswalk is basically the Chromium engine that gets ported in to, uh, as a web view sort of replacement that sort of helps you when you don't have the newer Chrome web view that's available on, or a Chrome backed web view rather that's available on new Android. So if you're pre KitKat and you want, you know, the, you want Service Worker for instance, or you want Shadow um, that would be a hard thing to do in the old Android web view and you get really horrible performance. Um, because the old browser slash web view on Android is horrible. Uh, we all know it, I know we all deal with this, but hopefully. We don't have to do this much longer. Uh, but yeah, you can use Crosswalk to sort of uh, deal with that problem. You don't have to use Crosswalk if you don't want. You can simply just use it internally and test, depending on what your sort of platform is. And then for the most part, um, on iOS, uh, I don't have a lot of data samples for it yet. We haven't pushed anything in our Cordova container with Polymer in it. Um, it should work fine. The kicker is, is that uh, certain things Old Polymer in the 0.5 branches was rather slow on Safari. So if you were using it on mobile, and did, did anybody use Polymer 0.5 in the old days? So Polymer 0.5 was pretty slow, right? It, 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 used the, it used the Shadow DOM polyfill, and that was tough because it was an epic engineering feat that sort of resolved a significant amount of problems, but it had created its own problem, which was it wasn't fast. Uh, because polyfilling Shadow DOM is brutal. Like, it just worked, but not fast. And that was harsh on Safari, that was harsh on mobile in general, because the memory usage was, just didn't work. Um, 1.0, and I'm sorry, 1.1, which is where we're at now, um, resolves that problem. Shady Dome is significantly faster on iOS now, so you don't get the jank um, that you would normally have when you were using 0.5. So if you use 0.5, you're like, I, didn't, I stopped using it because it was too slow on mobile, definitely try the latest version of Polymer. It's way faster, it sort of resolves a lot of that uh, sort of request problems and jank uh, not, I don't know that there is specifically, if, if, if you want a basic example of how it works, I probably can push one, because we, we've got an app right now that's getting wrapped, that's basically a web app that they want a container for, uh, and I think we wrote a sample for it, so if you can't find one, you can ping me, and I will put one up, uh, to sort of guide as a test. Um, Cordova is not terribly hard to use, um, and there are cases for it and against it, so it really sort of depends on what you're trying to accomplish too. Um, you know, it could be something that you, you already have an application that does something you want to simply port into those platforms within the container set. Um, it is a little different now though too, so the mobile website, um, from a Chrome standpoint at least, uh, well even Firefox is in there. Um, you have application manifests, you can add the desktop home screen now. Um, if you haven't used Chrome on the latest sort of Android devices and whatnot, it's really nice for that. iOS is has some other features that are pretty cool too, but they don't quite clarity wise. But yeah, it really depends on what you're trying to do. But if you can't find one, let me know. I can put one out. 
I have one minute, and Mike is looking at me. I see you, Mike. You're over there, Mike. Mike's going to talk about Android now. <laughs> because I'm not talking about Android today. So, thank you very much. If you have questions, please think of Q. All right, so uh, let's just do a status check real quick. Your cloud's been stuff.